President of Amity Education Group and Chancellor of Amity University. We have Arnold Longboy, uh, the Executive Director of Recruitment and Admissions at the London Business School. Uh, Dr. Sonia Bin Jafar, CEO of Al Hurair Foundation for Education. Welcome. And Mark Pelici, the HR and Vice President of um, the MIA region for Schneider Electric. So without further ado, today we will go into discussion and what I might ask the speakers to do is just introduce themselves, tell us a little, about, a little bit about the educational institution they work for and their role within the institution. And then we'll go into asking some questions about the future of education. So can we start with Dr. Atul? Dr. Atul, can you tell the audience a little bit about your uh, at Amity University and your role at the university. Yes. Uh, thank you, Soraya. First of all, uh, let me thank Forbes Middle East for organizing this uh, great session on the future of education. As we all know, the pandemic has transformed the way education will be handled in the future. Uh, uh, I represent the Amity Foundation. I am the president uh, of this not-for-profit foundation, which was set up by our family, specifically our founder, Dr. Ashok K. Chohan, about uh, 30 years ago, with an aim that what we can do to impact education in our country, in India, and uh, across the world. In the last uh, 25, 30 years, we have now built up uh, schools and universities across the world in 15 countries. We currently have 175,000 uh, students uh, who are studying with us. And about a decade ago, we looked at the UAE and our commitment to the region. And we're very proud and honored that we have established a, a great university in, in Dubai with thousands of students from uh, all over the world who are studying uh, various subjects with us. Uh, we also have uh, international baccalaureate and Indian curriculum schools in Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and Sharjah. So we have a big uh, commitment uh, to the Middle East region as a foundation and to education. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Atul, for that um, introduction. I might go to uh, Mr. Arnold Longboy. Can you please tell us a little bit about uh, London Business School and your role within the institution, please? Oops, sorry. Um, you'll have to unmute, uh, Arnold. You're on mute. Here we go. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to start by saying, I think three of the most commonly asked questions over the last few months have been, when is this pandemic going to end? Can you put yourself off, off of mute? And can you see my slides? So there you go. One of the questions that was just asked to me. Um, <laughs> thank you, Forbes, uh, Soraya, and, and colleagues uh, for organizing this today. I am Arnie Longboy. I am the Executive Director for Recruitment Admissions at London Business School, mainly responsible for the selection of what I call our future alumni of the school. We are a, a standalone graduate business school, which has about 2,200 students every year across um, several different countries, 66 different, more than 70 different nationalities are represented in our student body. Uh, we have our main presence in London, but we also do have a program in Dubai and have now for the last 12 years. Uh, very quickly, we have 12 different graduate programs catering to the very uh, different levels uh, where you are in your career. We have a very strong, what I call pre-experience set of master's programs. Those can be a master's in management to a master's in analytics and management. We have the traditional two-year MBA as well, a master's in finance, and then we have what I call the programs for our executive students. So these 12 programs are all degree uh, granting programs, but we also have a, a large uh, portfolio of what I call non-degree executive education courses as well. I'm responsible just for the degree educational programs. So as I said, we've had a presence now in Dubai for, for 12, 12 years and uh, can talk more about what we're doing there uh, when the time comes. Thank you, Arnold. 
Um, we might go across to Dr. Sonia. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the Al Horaira Future Foundation, please? Of course. So the Abdullah Al Hurair Foundation for Education was launched in 2015 and it supports the provision of high quality educational opportunities for Emirati and Arab youth across the region. Um, we are one of the largest privately funded philanthropic organizations in the region and we focus solely on promoting education for elevated livelihoods. So our purpose is to provide greater access to today's youth to tomorrow's opportunities, essentially, so we can so they can positively contribute to the region's development. And um, as for myself, I am the chief exec executive officer, so I run the foundation essentially on behalf of my uh, my benefactor. Great, thank you, Dr. Sonia, for the introduction. Mark, we'll go over to you now, just for a quick introduction about the Schneider Electric and your role. Yes, thank you, Soraya, and thank you, Daniel and Forbes, for organizing this very, very interesting uh, webinar. Marc Pelletier, I'm uh, the Vice President for Schneider Electric in Human Resource in Middle East in Africa. Schneider Electric is actually uh, the leader worldwide for energy management, automation, and software. And we basically power homes, buildings, infrastructure, data centers, industries from a digital field or non-digital field. We, uh, we have actually 7,000 people uh, in Middle East in Africa. We cover 74 countries. And we will be sp certainly spending a lot of time on explaining what we are doing here uh, on the education field and how virtual learning can be contributing to the development of Middle East in Africa. Suraya, you're, you're on mute. Suraya, you're on mute. Right. I apologize. <laughs> what I might do is just keep myself off mute so I don't have to worry about muting and unmuting. But for everybody else, if you have that responsibility um, of just unmuting while you speak, that would be great. Thank you so much. Um, and, and thank you for being patient with me. Okay, so without further ado, we've now heard um, introductions from all the speakers and you know, no doubt they're amazing speakers from very, very uh, reputable institutions. So let's start with Dr. Atul. Um, Dr. Atul, what I'd like to, to ask you today is that um, COVID has really changed the landscape in every industry. And today we're focused on what influence and I guess change it has had on the education institution. I'd like to just look and ask questions about, you know, the university and look specifically at what changes and how, how did the university respond to the forced uh, lockdown period um, and, and still provide students with the quality of education that it, that it prides itself on. So can we start by looking, by looking at that? Sorry, is Dr. Atul with us? Okay. Sorry, thank you so much. Um, I think if we look at uh, universities in general, uh, they are very, very resilient. You know, if you uh, take a stock of the percentage of universities that have survived over the centuries, the percentage is much, much higher uh, than what any corporate has across, uh, across time. So when this pandemic struck, I think it took everyone by surprise, uh, though, of course, everyone prepares... Uh, Sorry, Dr. Atul, uh, Danielle? I think we've, uh, Dr. Atul has, has internet issues, it says. Okay. I think we can wait for him to join back. You can you can move on, uh, sorry. We'll wait for okay. Dr. Atul. So what I might do then is, I guess, uh, Arnold, how about we go across to you, coming from the London Business School, um, and you offer education and degrees. Oh, sorry, Dr. Atul has just joined us. Yes, Sorry, Dr. Atul, we lost you for a moment there. Yes, uh, my apologies. So, um, so we took it head on, and uh, we are uh, we are very uh, privileged at at the Amity Foundation that everyone who works with us, whether it is at the leadership position or the or the faculty members, uh, we have one passion, and which is to really uh, nurture and uh, and groom uh, young uh, professionals, and and give them sort of the best education and experience that we can. So we took it head on that, how can we immediately take everyone on, on to remote learning and, uh, and the benefit of having a network across the world and having uh, colleagues. I think one thing in, in higher education, I mean, we are also a very large uh, business group uh, 
as a family. So one thing we see in education, which is different from the corporate world is that there is a lot of sharing of ideas, sharing of best practices. Uh, people are less secretive. So we reached out uh, with leading universities and colleagues around the world that what is the best way uh, to go about it. And, uh, and we're very happy that within, um, within a week of the lockdowns happening across the world and, and Dubai and Abu Dhabi really were the first campuses of ours around the world uh, to go in a full uh, remote uh, teaching mode. And we were able to get uh, our 170,000 students all remotely uh, being educated uh, at the safety of their homes. And uh, it really um, sort of push started um, this whole concept of online education. Even those faculty who used to be skeptical that can we teach remotely? Can we use technology? It has really uh, transformed their mindset that it is possible. In this case, it was in a case of emergency. Uh, so we are continuously now working on, we've had hundreds and hundreds of hours of faculty development programs uh, to see, to actually train our faculty on how to teach remotely because it is fundamentally different. Uh, any faculty who teaches in the classroom will know that teaching online is different. And I think across the world, all faculty uh, colleagues are, are really adapting uh, to this new normal. Um, but one thing, there are also many benefits that we saw, which we had never uh, really thought about, though, of course, Zoom and, and various technologies existed. Uh, in the last uh, two months, we have had over 1,600 uh, senior people, whether it was uh, the Dalai Lama or Nobel laureates or CEOs from top institutions and organizations around the world. They've been able to come uh, online and interact with our students, which maybe earlier uh, we were not doing, even though the technology was there, it existed. So it, it has really pushed us to do so that. It's almost like it pushed you to become creative and create opportunities to give yeah. more yeah. access and more um, information and a, and a diverse experience for students. Is that right? Yes, no, absolutely. I think, you know, I think that is what life is. Uh, sometimes you get... Um, comfortable in, in the way if everything is working well, people think, why should we change it? You need uh, sort of an external stimulus, uh, as you were saying, to be more creative. And, and this, and what I think all universities around the world have suddenly realized is that this technology has been existing for many, many years. We just uh, uh, did not do the extra effort uh, to utilize the technology. And and what everyone, I mean, as I speak to our leadership and, and our professors across the world, everyone is saying that even when the world becomes normal and the lockdowns and the traveling restrictions uh, finish, we will continue using this, uh, this technology uh, in our classrooms and in our universities. Excellent. I might come back to you and ask you a little bit about the you know, university strategies going ahead into 2020. And I can see Dr. Sonia was smiling as you were making some comments there. So I'd love to hear from her shortly, but I might just go to Arnold for the moment because Arnold, you're from the London Business School. So you may have had a similar or different experience from Dr. Atul. Can you tell us a little bit about what trend or what you saw happening in the sphere of, of you know, the education during COVID and post COVID and what, what the London Business School intends to do going forward? Yes, I think, um, as Dr. Tull said, we, we were also in the same boat. And, and in fact, that's, that's what's made this very interesting. The fact that everyone was put into the same situation. We all more or less had to go to, into lockdown at the same time, and then also had to pivot and respond to how we were going to be working with our students uh, very quickly. So very similar experience where um, we had to pivot very quickly. I was really proud of our, our colleagues, faculty that were able to, to uh, go online and start learning for many, in many cases, how to use technology that um, they had to some extent been resisting, but now doing it and have adopted it fully. And, and in terms of the student experience, many of them approached it skeptically as well. Uh, but I have to say the experience has been very positive for many, for many of them. Uh, we did a survey uh, a couple months after they'd been doing online courses. The question was, how have you found your online experience? And for the most part, it was very uh, positive, extremely positive. In fact, 78% saying that their online experience was good to excellent. So that was, um, that was a nice uh, result to get considering 
as many of the uh, institutions uh, were facing a lot of skepticism. Uh, it was a really emotionally charged time for, for a lot of the schools as well. My own daughter who was in university, um, she and I had some, some big discussions about what her experience was gonna be like and can probably share that from a personal point of view later on as well. Uh, what it's really allowed us to do as well is we'd always, um, part of our strategy was the adoption, uh, more adoption of technology to enable us to enhance the, the learning experience. And what we were thinking was gonna take a few months actually happened in a uh, few years, sorry, happened in a few months. So now that's been adopted. We were forced into this experiment. We've been learning as we go and just um, what I call some virtual surprises have occurred as well, especially on the student side where Again, as Dr. Atul said, getting access to, to some of these great speakers um, it was, one, was one big plus. Um, it, it takes, I mean, a lot of our faculty have these connections, so you need to have these connections with these big time speakers and, and high profile speakers to begin with. But always in the past, they'd had to travel to London or to Dubai, to Dubai, and even if they were in the city, time-wise, it'd be hard to get them to campus. Now in one week, one of our students said she was able to see the CEO of BP, um, listen to a former prime minister, listen to uh, in her pricing class, listen to the person who had done the pricing strategy for the Olympics in Japan, all within one week. And she was saying, if it had been a, even if in a typical week, she'd, those had all been scheduled, she probably wouldn't have had the time to attend all three of those, those uh, sessions, but she was able to do it. Uh, given that it was virtual okay, as well. Interesting. So the trend seems to be that there was more increased opportunities and it almost, it wasn't forced, but it was a catalyst to think more creatively and innovatively to enhance the student experience. Mm -hmm. Arnold, you made some very interesting points. I'll come back to those definitely, but okay. I just want to move um, quickly to Dr. Sonia, just to get your uh, perspective on what Dr. Atul and Arnold have said, but also, um, you know, from the AGF's perspective, I'm just going to use that acronym if, if that's okay, instead of... Um, uh, the long title for the organization. Can you just tell us a little bit about um, what you saw happening during the COVID period? And if it has been a catalyst for anything, what has it been for? And what do you see the trend um, going forward in the higher education? And if we take, you know, Atul and Arnold's tone, opportunities that have, have been created. Yeah, thank you. Um, we'll say AGFE for short. Okay, um, I think... I think that there is consensus that COVID-19 is not going away. And even if it does, it's not gonna be the only one. Um, so I think I wanna start there. Uh, the midterm solutions that are addressing the idea of what's happening now is that, you know, it's gonna take, you know, over a year before we see a vaccine on a large scale. So the new normal is here to stay for a while. Beyond that timeline, when we're projecting into long-term realities, we need to have solutions that are going to address regular closures, should there be something else. And you know, the scientific community is completely on board with this. We have, you know, the research from Singapore worldwide that that tells us if you don't like that, you know, you can always listen to the business people. Bill Gates has come out very publicly, this won't be the last pandemic we face. So everyone needs to adapt and prepare, including higher education. Um, I don't know that we're going to return to what was that status quo. And I've heard that from a couple of people, you know, I can't wait till we just go back to normal. Well, we'll go back to a normal. It's just not going to be the, the old normal. So we need responsive solutions, better contingency plans to be, to be in place um, to recognize that. And I, and I'm hearing this as well from the others that, the emergency remote teaching is one thing and the level of quality has been a little surprising for people that it was a little better than we expected we would do almost but as we move forward and it's no longer emergency response but we now have the time to to plan this the expectation for the quality of teaching and learning is going to be higher for the longer term solution um and in the region, the, the institutions seem to think about online learning completely differently than they did about face-to-face -face programs. It's not taking face-to-face -face and putting it online. And there's to us three key opportunities that can come up. The first is flexible and support for lifelong learning. 
it's going to be appealing to this new market of students, such as those trying to juggle family responsibilities, work and studies, women, older students. Um, we see this in our own scholarship program, our online learning scholars at the foundation, 70% are working while pursuing their master's online. In addition to that, um, we're going to be seeing, hopefully, more accessible models than traditional teaching models. Universities now have an opportunity for a wider pool of applicants in the region and beyond. Um, they're going to be seeking specializations that are context relevant. And so that you know, means that the needs of the local and the regional labor markets are going to come into play. And if the universities want to respond to that quickly, that's going to be something that's going to be very advantageous for them in terms of their own market strategies. And the IT is by far more scalable than traditional in-person programs. So in Georgia Tech, they offer a master's in computer science online that costs the students one sixth of the on-campus version. And because of that, in three years, the program's capacity went up by 97%. They now have three times more students than they did. That's an innovation that is sustainable for the university and gives greater access to more students. So that's a great opportunity that we're seeing. Um, and, I, and I'll end with, and the reason that it's successful is because they chose very consciously to pay greater attention to the student experience. So it's not just about making sure the content is there, it's about making sure that they're going to be successful, preparing them for work, building better partnerships with industry, finding ways to incorporate experiential learning, you know, making sure that their well-being is being addressed. So there's a lot of opportunities. I'll pause there and we can talk yeah. more. If you I, I was just gonna say, thank you so much, Dr. Sonia, Sonia, because you've just finished with a point which I think is very relevant to bring in Mark at that point. I mean, the point you've made about the scalability of education and making it so global cost that it's now accessible you know by people all over and it really um now allows you know the student experience as well to be enhanced and therefore greater access to opportunity and work and this is exactly what i understand schneider is doing mark can you tell us a little bit about um schneider electric and its programs for students and in particular the free ones we were discussing earlier today Absolutely, uh, so yeah. And actually, to uh, to echo to uh, to the other panel speaker, we have seen a huge acceleration thanks to COVID, or because of COVID, in terms of uh, digitization. We see it in our business because our customers are asking for more remote control, more predictive maintenance, more analytics. But we also see it indeed in the virtual learning field, and we have actually a platform at Schneider Electric called Schneider Energy University which is a platform we, uh, we started to operate more than 10 years ago, which is totally online, available 24 seven, wherever you are, you can access to it, it's free, free of charge. And this platform has been a huge, a huge, uh, faced a huge acceleration in the last six months. We have seen a doubling of the number of people registering to this platform. We have about 50% of students registering to this platform and the remaining part are professionals. Because when we speak about education, of course, we speak about youngsters, people being at the university, but education is actually something that's gonna be going along the life. Uh, probably in the past, we were learning something for life and we're having a job for life, but we see today that we need to keep upskilling and educating ourselves day after day. So thanks to the Schneider Energy University, 27,000 people have been certified between January 2020 and end of June. It's a huge acceleration, two times more people certified when we compare to the same period last year. So as you can see, uh, digitization has been, uh, has been accelerating here. The benefit of this platform is that you can get access to, uh, to free online course in 14 language. For Middle East in Africa, most of the language will be available. You have it in Arabic, you have it in English, you have it in French, eventually in Turkish. So the population from uh, the 70 countries where we are operating in Middle East in Africa are covered with their local language. And you have access to more than 200 uh, online courses. And you start with eventually very basic courses for electrician or for, for youngsters and students in the university to, uh, to learn about basics around motors, around energy management, around sustainability, how to make buildings more green, how to operate data centers, 
how to make automation become a digital field to have a better control for your process. It's really, really important because we are helping, educating people in their journey to get a job or for people having a job to keep maintaining their learning and get upskilled and developed uh, along the job they have. What we have seen uh, is an acceleration in terms of registration. Today, about 1,200 people are registering uh, per month into, uh, into this online platform. The, the big countries are Egypt, Nigeria, South Africa, Turkey, Morocco, uh, the UAE. So we see that across the board, all countries in Middle East and Africa are very, very interested in this type of online course. So a growing appetite in terms of virtual learning. Thank you, Mark. But it sounds like um, Schneider is really ahead of the game. It didn't really wait for COVID to, to bring out this initiative. It's been going for some time now, but what you've seen now, I guess, is an increased appetite from people. Um, and what you're saying is that the, the motivation and the inspiration for Schneider was always to educate people and give greater access to students to really advance themselves and potentially be recruited by Schneider. Is that right? So once they go through the program, they have more of an opportunity to be recruited at some point by Schneider. Fantastic. So what I want to do now is we looked at and I guess we can see a trend and a consensus amongst all the speakers about the, I guess, response and during COVID and, and the trend in terms of a, a spike and a surge in the numbers of people now seeking online education. What I want to look now and is project to the future, and how you see um, the future of education. And particularly, I wanted to ask the university, so London Business School and also um, uh, Amity, moving forward, how will the educational models change? Do you have a strategy to change the traditional model from being face-to-face -to, -face to either a hybrid or to a full remote online learning? Can you tell us a little bit about your, your short and long-term strategies? Dr. Atul, we might start with you. Yes. Um, so I have a very interesting uh, question that you have raised and will be one that all academics around the world uh, will be really uh, discussing and researching on. I think my personal view very strongly on this is uh, though remote uh, learning is a very good supplemental uh, tool to academics, uh, and especially if we're talking about um, formal higher education degree programs. But in the end, uh, what is education about? And uh, when students go to universities, it is really to discover themselves, discover their strengths, to sort of transform get confidence, uh, make a good group of friends who will be friends for life. And the knowledge that they really get, of course, is very, very important. But if we see over the lifespan of a person, the knowledge that they get from the university uh, is less important than the other aspects of, of being on a campus. So my strong feeling is that in the future, uh, the the learning that universities will get from this experience of remote teaching is that uh, the hybrid mode or flipped mode of education will drastically increase. And of course, uh, all universities, even our, our uh, university campus in Dubai had really been for the last couple of years been working uh, tremendously on, uh, on using the flipped uh, mode of teaching where basically the theoretical aspect of the, the class is recorded, which the student can see at their own time. And the, the classroom time or on-campus time is used more for interaction with the uh, dialogue with the professor or dialogue with the colleagues. And this uh, really, as, as everyone has been saying, what may have taken two years, three years, four years will really fast track. And I, and I now presume in the next uh, one or two years, virtually all universities will be using uh, this mode of, uh, of teaching. Uh, I think another big aspect that this um, remote learning has done is bring in the transparency uh, in, in what educationists have uh, to deliver. You know, even if we see, if we read uh, Plato uh, of so many years ago, his, uh, his writings on philosophy, uh, he mentioned that if you are buying a product, like let's say you are buying a sandwich, you can taste it beforehand, you can see how it is wrapped, uh, what quality it is. But education is something you only 
get to understand or the quality once it is already too late. And as he said, mm -hmm. your soul is already destroyed. But what this online has uh, education has done is that everyone is seeing over the shoulders uh, at the school level, parents are seeing, uh, relatives are seeing. So uh, faculty have really had uh, to sort of uh, become more responsible in terms of, of what they're teaching. And, and that will really transform the education system. Excellent. Okay, so what I'm really hearing from you is you think the way forward will be a hybrid model. And, yes. and the intention is really to enhance the student experience where the face-to-face -face element is going to be much more interactive than perhaps what it previously was. Um, so that's a you know interesting, I mean, to me, it sounds really interesting. Arnold, can I... Uh, just hear from you in terms of London Business School and what you think their strategy is going to be going forward. Do you do you agree with Dr. Atul in terms of a hybrid model being the ideal model and the way forward for education, or do you have a different idea about what it will look like going forward? Sorry, I believe you were on mute, <laughs> Arnold. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, sorry. Um... As I said earlier, what, what the pandemic has, has allowed us to do, and it was just repeated by Dr. Atul, is that uh, the, our adoption of technologies has really accelerated. And uh, we've, we've, we've seen now a lot of good in terms of what I call blended uh, approach. So using technology to complement uh, what we had face-to-face. -face. This autumn, we are actually will be starting uh, virtually for, for about a few weeks but then quickly thereafter going to the hybrid model, allowing those that can come to our campus in, in Dubai and or London especially, uh, the, the ability to have the face-to-face, -face, but also still uh, the school has to keep in mind much of what the government has imposed on us in terms of physical distancing and you know, uh, health and well-being uh, 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 considerations that we have we have to put in place. So it will be a hybrid model um, from September 21st going forward. And I can see that being there for, for a few months, but it really is again for us using technology to enhance what has really been um, a main factor for us many for many years is the value of of face to face. Uh, Dr. Atul mentioned or someone mentioned earlier the, the idea of this flipped classroom. So just to give you an example, whereas a professor would be spending, say, you know, an hour's time lecturing on some standard um, theory, can easily now put that on video, have the students look at that ahead of time, and then when they come together, use more of their time with, with discussions, higher value discussions, and where there's a lot of Q&A that can occur, a lot more time in that kind of discussion interaction than they would have had in the past. Um, so that is how we, we plan on, on using technology and, and also um, not just for students though, what, what it's allowing us to do is provide or enhance what we call the lifelong learning um, aspects of what we want to provide for our alumni as well. And with 42,000 alumni you know, spread across the world, 155 countries, the scaling that we can see from the technology is really allowing us to, to enhance the um, the experience beyond just the on-campus experience too, where many who had graduated several years ago can now access the, that, that favorite professor they had on the, on the latest, um, say on you know, the economics of pandemics, for example. Okay, thanks Arnold. Mark, I wanna come over to you because Schneider Electric's um, platform is all online. And the, the idea is that it gives you know, people in remote locations the ability to access education, which means the face-to-face -face element is really reduced. So we've just heard from Dr. Atul and Arnold about a hybrid um, and they, in their view, that that's the ideal uh, mode of learning. What's your opinion on this, given that you've worked with um, you know, the remote learning and this is, the, the fundamental, I guess, uh, framework of Schneider Electric. So do you share their opinion or do you have a different opinion on remote learning versus hybrid learning and, and what the future of education will look like? I, I fully share this opinion. And by the way, uh, there is no one way or uh, one side fits all in terms of learning. I mean, we all have to contribute and we all have to partner together. We partner with universities, universities partner with the, the private sector or with NGOs. So all together, 
we have a big role to play in terms of education. And as uh, this virtual learning is moving, we see that it's bringing probably more agility, more adaptability, uh, an appetite to, uh, to be able to upskill uh, your, uh, your, 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 your education. That means you will be able all along your life to keep learning. This is something that will be extremely interesting where universities will, uh, will play a big role, obviously, and the private sector will also play a big role. At Schneider Electric is our contribution is that when we certify people, we help them to either enter at to Schneider Electric or to eventually get a job. When we look at the needs of, uh, of Africa or Middle East in Africa, one of the big challenge that the continent in Africa, for instance, is facing is access to electricity. Uh, probably only 43% of the population in Africa is having access to electricity or clean water. Because without electricity, you cannot have clean water. That means life. So powering electricity, powering energy means also life for people. So when we educate people, when we train people, students or professionals to be well educated, to power life, to, run, to work around pumping, uh, to work around how we, uh, we, we bring electricity to remote villages, we are actually creating jobs for people, we are helping communities uh, to have a better life. And I, I can tell you that when I was based in Thailand before joining in Dubai, I was actually seeing uh, young children getting for the first time of their life access to electricity and seeing light after 6 p.m. They were able to, to learn after 6 p.m. And you were seeing in their eyes how they were absolutely uh, uh, delighted for the first time of their life to, uh, to get powered. It was very, very powerful. So we see that upskilling will be certainly, as Arnold was saying before, something that will accompany each and every one during a long life journey and a work life journey. So education is not one time. And here we have all a role to play. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Dr. Sonny, I want to get your opinion in terms of um, a hybrid learning, remote learning, and I guess upskilling and reskilling um, student candidates to move into the workforce. So Mark has touched on that, but can, I, can we hear from you about your perspective and the work that you do at the AGFE? Yeah, sure. I think in order to answer this question, I, I want to talk a little bit about the partnerships that I'd like to see, that I think that this will engender. Um, so there, clearly there's a lot of shifts in the air and I, and I read some of the comments from the, the participants who, who have some concerns about these shifts. Um, but I think if you have an open mind, you're gonna flourish. It's, it's not really more complicated. Um, the fact that we have an economic downturn, campus shutdowns is just an opportunity for online education and corporate connections to really take root. Um, the reality is during economic downturns, people lose their jobs. This is not a first, it won't be the last. And when that happens, there's a tendency to upskill. It's not new. Between 2007 and 2010, the recession profoundly changed the American landscape of work. Nine million people's jobs just disappeared, right? In 2016, the National Bureau of Economics reported that that downturn acted as a catalyst for employers to crank up skills and those skills were tied to certain occupations and it was essentially taking advantage of widening access to technology. Fast forward to now, it's not really that different. You know, a sales job used to consist of developing relationships with customers. Now it involves data analysis tools to target products for certain clients. Does that mean that a salesperson is out of work? Well, yes, if they think that they're still building relationships with individuals, but if they're willing to go back and understand data analytics, big data, uh, understand how to use a dashboard, you know, understand how to, you know, do the marketing differently, they've got not only a job, but they've got a higher end job now. You know, when the economy is down, people go back to school, but school is closed. You know, so now what what happens? We need to be responsive and flexible. and you know, as as every one of us have, has learned, but um, as you've just mentioned, you know, remote workers and people who can work creatively and effectively from a distance, um, that's just something that's a baseline now. And universities need to be on board with helping students get there. If you do not help students get there, I'm sorry, you're not doing your job anymore. 
You know, we have in 2016, the McKinsey Global Institute estimated 14% of the workforce would have to switch occupations because of this, because of automation and artificial intelligence by 2030. We need to get them there. And corporates are being corporates. I mean, Schneider is, is, is doing an amazing job. We can't expect every single corporate institution to do this, however. Um, I think that the recruitment and training is costly and we have universities. If we can connect the corporates to universities organically, we have an opportunity. Both parties need to change the relationship. So better relationships. So right now in the States, um, Coursera for Campus is taking root. This is a global learning platform. They're building practical bridges. The labs that are being built are being the projects are being designed by corporates. When the students do those projects online, fully online, incidentally, it's serving as assignments for course credits. That kind of integration is innovative and it's moving us all forward so that, you know, it's allowing the private sector to get involved in a responsible way, not to dictate curriculum, but to give opportunities for practical learning. Um, it's allowing universities to think about you know, industry-based projects and co-ops to look at remote work, to incorporate that into their programs, into joint ventures. And so those are the kinds of opportunities that I see that will be really interesting. Dr. Sonia, I'd like to pick up on that point because Dr. Atul is nodding his head there and you know, we're very aware that you're from a university. So what is your perspective um, on what Dr. Sonia has had and what will Amity going forward be doing about this if it's already um, planned and prepared for, for what Dr. Sonia has spoken about? Yes, I think uh, what Dr. Sonia just said is, is absolutely relevant. And uh, I think universities have multiple roles to play. So of course, um, research, uh, fundamental research in, uh, in basic areas is, is very, very important uh, for generation of new knowledge, but also to have applied research, uh, applied teaching, which is industry relevant uh, is a big responsibility because in the end, the corporate world is looking at universities to generate uh, uh, manpower uh, that can come and be productively employable. And many times uh, universities around the world have to uh, hear from the industry that uh, we have to retrain the manpower that is, or, or the students who are coming outside of universe, out of the universities. So at Amity, uh, many years ago, we made this concept of industry led institutions where we have partnered with some of the leading uh, institutions uh, from ar or businesses around the world. I'll give an example, uh, Tata Technologies uh, is, um, is a company of uh, the leading uh, multinational of India, the Tata Group, which focuses on designing engines for cars like uh, Jaguar, Land Rover, and they design uh, Rolls-Royce engines uh, for airlines. And together with them, we have set up uh, the Tata Institute uh, of Technology at the Amity campus where 50% of the faculty are engineers from the company. 50% are faculty of ours. Uh, we have replicated all the labs that they have in their company, in their factories. Um, uh, the students do all their internships at the Tata companies. And we see a phenomenal uh, transformation in these students when they come out uh, in terms of their employability, the, the practical knowledge they have, because the industry is actually coming to the campus of a university and teaching what they know is required uh, for the future. So this concept of industry and universities partnering is, is absolutely needed. And, and we have seen a huge difference in what it can make. I bet Dr. Sonny is very glad to hear those comments by Dr. Atul. So there is some um, proactiveness from the universities in terms of bridging those gaps and really equipping with students uh, with the right tools, not just from a theoretical and knowledge base, but also um, from an industry perspective, which is great. Arnold, can you tell us about whether that's happening also at the London Business School? So I know that most of the students that enroll with the Business School are postgrad students. So they've probably had an undergrad um, degree. They've gone off for some time 
time, gain some um, industry experience, and then come back to the university. So how do you upskill or reskill or keep them sort of up to date? And what do you see as being the trends and what is London Business School that's doing similar or differently from, from Amity? Mm -hmm. Yes. So as you said, we are we are a graduate school focused on, on business education. So the tie-in with business is, is critical for us and making sure that what we teach our students can be readily applied once they're employed by the likes of, Sh of Schneider Electric and, and others. Um, we also focus on, so a, a big differentiator for us is our focus on core research. And I think that is still a competency that universities or business schools like us um, you know, have the resources to do. And, as, we, as we've been saying, it, it's more critical than ever now to make sure that when we're making decisions and putting things out there, be it about the pandemic or other things, that it's based on solid research that's unbiased. And I think that's still a role that universities, places like London Business School um, can, can thrive and thrive in. Um, experiential learning is also critical, as you said, uh, not just focusing on the theory, um, we believe you still need to, to understand some of the theory so that you, you don't just jump on the latest fad again, but so a theory combined with some experiential learning is critical. Uh, that is often a key component of why students join London Business School because of the experiential learning. We've had to adjust a bit, um, whereas we, we would uh, send students out to different companies and countries and working closely with companies to, 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 to work on some of the challenges that they face but we've been able to do this virtually as well and probably at a larger scale than in the past. Um, and another example of how we partnered with, with businesses is this past year was the first year of our one year masters in um, analytics and management. And before we launched that program, worked really closely with the employers, the companies that we partner with to make sure that content, their curriculum was aligned with what the companies were looking for. So it's a master's in analytics and management it, um, it's, as everyone is seeing across the world, huge demand for that kind of uh, curriculum and analytics, business analytics. And um, the companies can be, can be rest assured that once they graduate from our programs, they're gonna be ready from, from day one to, to work um, on the challenges that the companies are facing. So that was a great partnership in terms of formulating our curriculum based on the needs of companies there as well. Um, you know, another thing I've noticed, uh, just going back to pandemic, is how we were talking about this earlier, how we, we as executives seem to be working 30% more online, um, mm -hmm. whereas with the students, they seem to have, um, I don't know if they have more time, but they're, they're doing a lot more too. And one of the things I just recently heard is how they've been volunteering a lot to help those in need um, within the community, be it uh, people in, in, in care homes that aren't able to access food, They've been going to them, providing them food. But uh, related to businesses, we have a small business initiative where students with their business knowledge have gone out to small businesses. You know, they could be four, five, 10 people businesses and, and have gone to teach them about cash flow management, basic accounting, how they can maybe improve their marketing. And that was all on a volunteer basis as well. We did that in London and UK. We're hoping to scale that further out and it could even become a regular program that, that we scale globally. Wow, that's fantastic. Great initiative by some of the students. Um, yeah. It sounds like, so not only access to learning, but also it's helped them to be more creative about how they use their time and implement the, some of the skills that they've learned through education, which is great. What I might do is um, the sentiment and the tone is, is very consistent across the board here, which is, which is good. I mean, it doesn't make for a debatable conversation, but it makes a good smooth one. Um, what I want to do is just touch upon maybe is the last sort of um, question that we really have and is we can see how the, the landscape of education has changed. So the way students are learning and um, the way teachers are teaching. Let's take a little bit of look about what they actually need to be learning. So one of the common words that keeps coming up here is technology. So we're looking at, you know, Dr. Sonia mentioned big data, you know, Dr. Atul was talking about AI. Um, again, Arnold was looking at, you know, data analysis and, and how these are going to be informing the educational space. So it sounds to me like there isn't only going to be um, a change in terms of using technology to deliver, but there also sounds like there's going to be a need for 
um, new knowledge in the in the space of technology and acquiring that. Now, I know, Dr. Atul, um, your university prides itself on um, upskilling and and or skilling um, students for the future jobs. So, what are those courses? Um, what do they look like? And what are the future jobs? And maybe we can hear from the other speakers as well after Dr. Atul. I think one of the biggest responsibilities of universities is really to equip uh, <clears throat> students to be uh, fit for the world in the future. And as one of the colleagues was saying a short while ago, that the world will be very different in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the line. And we, there will be hundreds of job profiles, which at the moment we can't even visualize what they will be. So, a big responsibility of ours as uh, educators is to teach students how to learn, how to always um, look out for developing themselves and lifelong learning from that point of view is very important as a university. Any student who graduates uh, from the portals of the university, uh, we support them uh, for decades and decades to uh, retrain themselves on the latest technologies. And we have a special uh, wing for that uh, organization, which is called the Amity Future Academy, where we run short term programs, uh, primarily uh, online programs, because it is meant for people who are working professionals, which looks at the latest technologies required for today and for tomorrow uh, to upskill, uh, upskill all the uh, all the professionals and uh, this is something which during this time of pandemic, uh, we actually offered free of cost uh, to students uh, and professionals around the world. And we were amazed that we had hundreds and thousands of, of professionals uh, who came online. And I think one of the great learnings for professionals during this time of the pandemic also was the great benefit that training yourself uh, can give you. And I think many of the professionals working never had the time or they never thought of that, but because they had maybe more time, they went out and they, they educated themselves uh, and they have upskilled and they're seeing, they're seeing huge benefits. So, uh, so that is really the future. Of you're on mute, Subhaya. Hi, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, sorry, Mark, I wanted to hear a little bit about you from what you think the future jobs are and what students really need to be upskilling in. Um, because I understand when we spoke earlier, there's a really big need, a massive need now, not just regionally, but globally um, in specific industries for knowledge and for advancements and, and really skilled uh, professionals. Can you tell us a little bit about what the gaps are in not so much education, but the workplace that students can access to get those high-end jobs that I think Dr. Sonia or Dr. Atul were mentioning before. Sure, and I, I imagine that some people attending the call today are very interested on, uh, on trying to understand where there are jobs for the future. We, I have already mentioned uh, previously that the access to energy is something that uh, is going from uh, an increasing interest. The World Bank has said that uh, until 2030, there will be about 4.5 million jobs only for renewable energy and only for solar lighting, more than 2 million jobs will be, uh, will be needed. So a big, big need uh, to, uh, to develop people in this field. Now at Schneider Electric, we also see a huge need for data. Uh, most of the panel speakers were mentioning about virtual learning. We cannot have this discussion today without data center. We cannot have this discussion without having uh, robust networks, good bandwidth, to, uh, to manage video and, uh, and, and audio. So data centers will need uh, to have certified people. And we at Schneider Electric uh, need to have partners uh, to, uh, to be able to operate and control uh, this data center. So data science, analytics uh, will, be, uh, will be of increasingly importance and there will be massive investment uh, in, uh, in the globe, but basically also in Middle East and, uh, and Africa. When I look at the industry field, uh, look at the region we are, we are covering. Uh, our industrial client uh, need more control, reliability, safety, process automation, uh, analytics, AI. So whether we go to food and beverage industry, oil and gas or mining, 
all these clients will need engineers, uh, business scientists, uh, operators uh, to be able to operate safely, remotely, eventually, uh, with uh, an operation of new technologies. So all these jobs will be needed. For Schneider Electric, this means a massive need from the university to, uh, to educate students for the future. This means for Schneider, new partner. And this means for Schneider Electric, also new business and people to recruit. So we are very, very happy here uh, to contribute. Thank you, Mark. Uh, just for the last question, I might go to Dr. Sonia, get your opinion on what the future of jobs is and what the AGFE is really focused on in terms of, you know, upskilling the students, um, particularly the Emirati and Arab ones, uh, to get the, you know, future jobs. So can you tell us a little bit about what the AGF is doing and your strategy as the CEO? Uh, sure. So we have we have multiple programs, and one of them is uh, our scholarship program, where we are giving individuals uh, that are high needs. So they're very they're high merit. I call them kids. They're young adults. Uh, they're high merit young adults um, who who wouldn't have had an opportunity to access higher education of quality had they not been given a scholarship. So we have you know, roughly about 500 uh, STEM scholars. So they're in the in 15 partner universities. And in addition to that, we have online uh, scholarships with Arizona State University and with, we used to have them with MIT as well. So those kinds of pieces are we focused on and we focus specifically on STEM and we focused on, you know, biomimicry and, you know, education and things that we know are going to go forward. We also engage with governments to support online learning um, and we conduct research on the issue. We support universities directly. So we're supporting the American University of Beirut and we've supported the American University of Cairo to take their pieces online regionally. We're working currently to co-construct a consortium of universities uh, for quality online learning in the UAE. And we're doing this in partnership with the Ministry of Education here. So we're really working in that space to be able to be a supportive partner. And I think in terms of our vantage point, it's almost a little bit of a privileged vantage point. Um, I always say I've, I've got a privileged uh, work uh, life because I'm not a university, I'm not a provider, and I'm not a regulator, I'm not government, and I'm not a vendor, I'm not really trying to sell anything, but I am an interested party because the Al Hurair Foundation for Education um, focus is on providing support. And we wanna provide support to those individuals like we do in terms of scholarships, but we wanna provide support to systems. So whether it's to governments, to um, organizations, to NGOs, whatever the system is, um, so that they can provide better access to higher quality for more people. And I think that in terms of our focus, that gives us an incredible vantage point because we're an interested party and we have funds to, to back our interest and to be supportive and we can galvanize support around it. So, you know, the Ministry of Education in the UAE has been very forward thinking in terms of online learning. Their standards um, for accreditation were released last year. So bringing the consortium together and getting on board with them was not a, a huge jump. It was just a natural progression of things. COVID-19 kind of moved it all forward. And so what that also does though, and, I, and I'm sensitive to this, so I, I wanna mention it because we have, as you mentioned, Soraya, had a very pleasant conversation of agreement. And I just noticed with the comments and I did want to highlight that there are still challenges and our challenges are still quite quite large and that's what we're trying to address. So as a foundation, we're trying to say we, we've noticed these challenges, um, we'd like to help. And there's a few challenges that I think I would be remiss if I didn't share them because our students told us what they were. You know, it's lack of interaction with the classmates, lack of motivation to study online, weak interaction uh, internet connections at home, um, fear about trying to get jobs. So, so Mark, you'll be uh, very interested in this one. And you know, when you take those individual concerns and you put them at the macro level, what is this about? It's about you know half our scholars 
having their learning disrupted and having to evacuate their accommodations and go home. Homes are single room homes with multiple people living in it and limited resources. There is a digital divide that's compounding the education divide. And talking about you know, the opportunities around on online learning without talking about the digital divide is marginalizing this particular group further. So I wanna make sure that we talk about this just for a minute. Um, so I think that there's a really important piece here about making sure that regulators address this, corporates address this, and universities address this as part of the solution. You know, and the other piece that I'll I'll mention and then and then I'll I'll stop um, is the emotional uh, and social well-being. And I think that you know, Dr. Atul, you actually mentioned this earlier, um, that connection that they need for one another. You know even though some of our scholars have online learning scholarships, the stressful situation of the economic crisis has, has brought stress into their homes and they're not coping well. And even though there are tools and opportunities to have support, they're not accessing them because of a multiple you know, reasons, including you know, they might not know that it's there, um, they don't feel comfortable, there's a little bit of stigma. So really bringing together that work experience and mental well-being into the fold of the academic learning, the content learning, and making that 360 support. That's what we do at the foundation, and we find that that's why we have success with our scholars. And we'd like to see more of that um, across the board with the regulators and, and the universities. I hope that's OK. Sarah, you're on mute again. I'm so sorry. I just didn't want any background noise to be affecting the quality of your talks, and then I keep um, muting myself. So, um, so thank you, Dr. Sonia, because you addressed one of the questions which I was going to put to everyone, um, which were not only the advantages, but what are the challenges being, and what do they think there, there will be going forward um, with the changing models of education. So you touched on that briefly, which was um, actually comprehensively, which was fantastic. So what I'm going to do now is since we've heard from all of the speakers, I'd like to address some of the questions that have come through online um, as you were speaking. And then I, you know, I, I will address it to one speaker in particular, but if, if another speaker has something to add, feel free to unmute yourself and add to that. Um, to that response. So the first, the first that I wanted to look at is there's a lot of concern around what the cost of education is and whether that will um, be reduced. Um, so people are obviously being affected not uh, financially by the COVID. And although we see that there's been a surge in the number of uh, students registering into courses, the cost factor is always an issue. Now, universities aren't free. They probably, um, not many that you know can afford to to provide free education we know you know schneider's doing it and they're doing a great job but university and and, and that quality and with that accreditation is not so what's your opinion on that dr tool and and the cost of education is that coming down likely to be yeah. you know um, how do we see that going forward you're right i think it's a very important uh, question uh, uh, for for all students and and parents i think what one has to realize is that uh, the, the cost of running a university is not just the infrastructure, uh, but also there is so much which goes into it. Uh, for example, a huge amount of resources are spent on research, on, on the great faculty uh, that, that a university has. And I think in the end, a university is not really the bricks and mortars, but the quality of, of faculty it has. So I, I feel in the short term, because Hopefully this COVID pandemic is not going to last very, very long. Uh, there will not really be much of an impact uh, uh, on the fee structure of universities. I know um, universities across the world are of course helping their students by making uh, installment plans, um, but how it will affect the future of fees, we will have to see. Of course, if we take uh, fully online uh, degrees, their cost structure many times is different, is lower. But what we have to realize, what universities are doing at the moment is not online teaching, but is a sort of remote teaching of a full-time degree. So there's we have to have a fundamental differentiation between what is education that is fully online and what is education that is actually 
uh, bricks and mortars education uh, being delivered. Uh, as uh, education will become more hybrid, I am sure it will have an effect on the cost of education because universities will be able to offer the same experience and the same education with less infrastructure because let's say 40% of the education will be delivered uh, online. And I think technology is one thing where the cost always keeps going down. Uh, it does not really increase in the future. So I think it looks good. The, I think that's the... a very positive response, and I'm sure lots of people in the audience wanted to hear that from you, Dr. Atul. And I've got some burning questions coming from the audience to direct the same uh, question to the London Business School. So, Arnold, can you tell us a little bit about the MBA that the London Business School provides and how you, and whether you see the cost of that will reduce now that there will be more of a hybrid um, you know, model of learning? Yeah, so I think similar to what Dr. Tool said, um, you know, the VAT, well, I'll speak just for London Business School and business education in general. Uh, last few years, we've actually seen an increase in, in demand for, for the degree, especially at London Business School and at Europe, whereas in the US, a lot of the business schools saw a fall. I think that's an indication that uh, many there in the market still see value coming from this degree, even if you know, across the board, many schools charge what um, um, is a premium price. So the, the value of the MBA is, is continuing. And I think career prospects as well will continue for, for our graduates. Um, there, is, there is always gonna be a high demand for high quality talent. And of course the best, um, the brightest and, and, and most prepared students are always going to find jobs. They're not necessarily gonna be in those traditional sectors that we've been sending them to in the past, uh, but there's, there's gonna be new opportunities that are, are coming up. Um, you know, someone mentioned the, the last recession and how financial services took a nosedive. Out of that, that situation came these opportunities in FinTech, for example. So we're seeing that now where some industries are thriving. Uh, we see it a lot in the tech, pharmaceutical companies. And so the best and brightest are still gonna continue to find, the, find, find jobs there. However, I, uh, you know, what Dr. Sonia said was, um, about equity, one of the things that concerns me personally is making sure that we do provide access to um, to those who you know merit, but also who wouldn't necessarily be able to afford an education like LBSs. And for that, we are putting a lot of emphasis in trying to get scholarships uh, from organizations across the world. Um, we recently got a, a, a nice donation from the Laidlaw Foundation that is targeting um, women who, who would never have thought about a business education from the likes of London Business School because they thought they could never afford it. Um, so now we, we are offering some full scholarships for women uh, based on need. Of course, they also have to be able to, to withstand the rigors of, of the um, uh, the academics as well, but it's more and more kind of scholarships that we're looking for and our alumni are also stepping up to the plate and, and saying as well, you know, I had great uh, opportunity at LBS, I'm doing well now, but I do have concerns about those who, who have less means and making sure that they actually have equal um, opportunity to, to learn what I did. So it's going to, it's going to take, um, work from us, the school, from our alumni stepping up, as well as other groups, foundations out there um, that, you know, also want more people to have access to this kind of education. Great. Thank you, Arnold. Um, I think you covered that quite comprehensive as well. So thank you. So there is another question coming from um, the audience. And, and that is, if, if the model of learning is going to change and it's going to be more remote and online, there won't be a need anymore for as many um, physical campuses and buildings within, within the UAE and even globally. Um, do you see that that is part of the strategy of universities that there won't be as many physical campuses in, in some of the regions? Uh, Dr. Atul, Arnold, or, or even Sonia or Mark? I, 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 I have a strong uh, view on this that uh, the university experience has to be a bricks and mortar experience. You know, it is, we may in the future uh, see uh, components of it going online. But as I had said earlier, 
um, it's a life experience, you know, and uh, there are some people who are, are not able to go to university and they are working and they do online degrees, but then uh, the need of that is, is a very different need. Uh, I think for young people, especially at the undergraduate uh, level or even at the postgraduate level, uh, there is a, a big uh, requirement to be with other people. In the end, we are, we are social animals, social beings. We have to learn the experience of being with other human beings, uh, with being the experience of being with people from different nationalities and, and growing up with them is really such a, a personality builder. Uh, so universities will be there. It may be the way they are built may be different. I mean, for example, in our lifetime itself, we have seen that you, that libraries have transformed. You know, in the traditional older universities, libraries were uh, places where uh, if you went in and you spoke, someone told you to stay quiet. If you look at uh, libraries now in universities, they are more uh, places of interaction where you can actually talk. Because as we have realized that uh, uh, what the value of interaction and group work is, because that is what is required by corporates. So universities will adapt, will develop, but campuses will stay. Nice, thank you, Dr. Atul. Um, Dr. Sonia, I've got two questions coming from the audience that I think are fitting for you. Um, so the first one is, how can digital learning support the forgotten third, which is those with special educational needs, disabilities, um, gifted and talented? So what, what's your opinion on that? Um, how can technology help? I, well, digital I think, learning, so I assume that, yeah, yeah yes, the, the on, different online forms of learning. Yeah, and, yeah uh, well, online. Well, the first thing I would say is um, in most of those cases that you're talking about in a physical environment, when you're in the education sector, in a classroom space, essentially, uh, technology is what's used to support those individuals in the class. So whether it be a gifted student or somebody who um, has difficulty uh, putting the words together on a page, we're now giving tablets and, and support systems to help them figure out how the how to focus your eyes and how there's so much technology out there now um, to to support those kinds of additional needs. We also have um, in terms of web based pieces. We also now have evaluative tools to decide how accessible uh, sites are. So very quickly they can look and say, you know what, you're you're not being accessible to this need or or that need, and so those things can be quickly um, identified and repaired um, if the will is there. So mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of support for the for for that um, group of individuals. I don't think that they're the forgotten third. I I think that they're very much in the forefront of a lot of our minds, um, and. And I would say that it's it's anyone who's marginalized is at the forefront of our minds. It's not it's not just this individual group. We we need to be inclusive, and we need to be inclusive not because you know it's the, it's the right thing to do. We need to be inclusive because um, there is not a single one of us, no matter how, where we are in our lives or how successful we are, that has not had a moment where we do, didn't feel like our needs were being met, and and we just. I always think that the fortunate people just had something um, in their lives that supported them or someone who understood. There's always that story of a teacher or, or somebody or a parent or a cousin who, who understood and was able to get you through that moment. Um, and we just want to systematize that, you know, because not everybody has, has that support structure around them. And I think inclusiveness is just part of this conversation, which is why I talked about the digital divide. Um, but, you know, again, this, we, we go to, you know, Dr. Atul and I will respectfully disagree about the campus um, piece. <laughs> I, I do agree that the campus experience is a great experience, but I also agree that if that is what we're going to promote as the ultimate goal, we're now marginalizing so many who won't even dream of affording that. So is there a stepping stone? Are there different models for different people? And the answer is, I, I believe, yes, there are. So let's explore that together. Um, and, and let's have the corporate sector help us explore that because if anybody can figure out logistics quickly, um, they can. And we see this with multinationals, you know, in response to, 
to different disasters. The multinationals are the first on the ground because their logistics are so good. You know, they 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 can lend a hand when they want to, um, and I actually believe that they generally want to. But sometimes, you know, the education sector is. You know, I'll be, I'll be a little bit, you know, I'll say this with trepidation. We can be a little bit arrogant. It's like, well, we know best. The corporates don't know best. And so let's, let's extend our hand and say, you know, can we do this better? Are you doing something that's better with your training? Can, can we talk together? Can we share space for learning? Because you're, you actually have um, a space in this rural area. Can we share that space so we could have that that learning environment there? I mean, there's a lot of different ways. And again, I go back to the original statement. If we're open-minded with a will, um, we can change the relationships and then we can change this, the, the entire um, landscape. Thank you, Dr. Sonia, for your, your perspective. Um, there's definitely, you know, advantages and disadvantages to the cat burst, online learning, you know, face-to-face. -face. Um, and this is really about, I guess, exploring those different opportunities and it'll work for some and it won't work for others. Um, but the future of education is such that it is changing and people will need to be open-minded as Dr. Sonia has reminded us many times and, um, and just to grow and to really, uh, embrace and go along with the lifelong process. So, um, Dr. Uh, sorry, Mark, uh, I'd like to just come to you for a moment and ask you a question that um, one of the participants has raised about industry led institutions being um, the future of education. Um, so, I won't read this question out verbatim, but what I understand is um, from what this question is asking is what are the future needs? What are the future educational needs, but also in terms of industry leading what the education will look like um, and, and the future job styles? Uh, can you tell us a little bit from your sure. perspective on this topic? Sure, let, let me try to answer this question, but also rebound on what uh, my distinguished uh, guests were, uh, were actually also saying. At Schneider Tech, we, say, we look at learning into uh, three E concepts, education, exposure, and experience. So we, we, we really believe that experiencing is super important. If we are not experiencing on the job, apprenticeship, for instance, is very, very important today because you come from the university or you come from a different background and you really want to learn a real work, a real job. So if we don't have these bridges between uh, education institution or people coming uh, just without degrees. This will be very, very important to have this apprenticeship, internship, whether they are virtual or on the job, will be certainly contributing to, uh, on the one hand, make the people feel more comfortable, more confident, have more trust in, uh, in their ability uh, to get to work. For the university, certainly also uh, very, very important because they will be able to uh, have a back and forth relationship uh, between uh, their, 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 their students and uh, the private sector. So for us, it's really, really important to, uh, to have this experiencing and exposure model because without that, we don't have people that are going to be able to be employed. Uh, on the field of what we need from the universities, as we are speaking about uh, something which is developing very fast, we need probably uh, to educate uh, our students on being more agile, being able to learn fast by themselves, to learn on how to learn. I think without that, we'll not be uh, preparing the students for the job of the future. I am able to tell you what are the, the probably uh, market and business that are going to need uh, to employ people for the coming 10 years. But I am not a guru to tell you what is going to happen in 15 or 20 years. It's very, very difficult today to predict. Therefore, we need to predict the unpredictable. And if we are not educating uh, students to be adjusted, adaptable to this new world, we will not be able to give them a job for life and they will need to probably change their, their career in many, many, many steps. So how to educate, how to train, how to prepare the people for this new world, because without that, we will certainly have and face a lot of challenges. 
Sorry, thank you, Matt. I see that there are lots of questions coming um, coming through. So I'm not sure if we're going to be able to answer all of the questions today, but what I can see and hear from our speakers is that they have touched on many of the questions that have come through. But we'll just take a few more. And Daniel, tell me if we've got more time or whether we need to um, come to a close. I might just take a few more questions. Um, and then I guess if there are any that we've not been able to answer in today's forum, you can reach out to Daniel and ask those questions and we can uh, possibly have the speakers at a later time email back responses or organize a call. I'm not sure if the, the speakers would be happy to do that, but I'm sure they will. Um, after having spoken with them all today, they seem like um, amazing and, and really inspiring speakers. So let's just take a few more before we wrap up. Um, well, we, can, we can wrap up in, in five minutes from now. So All right, excellent. No worries. So I guess what I'm sensing and, and the trend of the, the questions are really that we've looked at digital education, we've looked at the future of education, and, and there's no shying away from the fact that a lot of it is going to incorporate technology and, and be online. Um, yes, there will be some face-to-face, -face, but there seem, still seems to be some fear amongst the, the audience or the participants that you know digital education is going to take away from that social skill. It's going to take away from the ability to develop teamwork and um, cooperation and, and the soft skills that, that students or, or, you know, prospective employees need in an organization. So, you know, Dr. Atul, one of the things you've spoken about having on-campus learning is to have that physical experience where you're learning this. Um, but even universities is not enough. There needs to be, going to university won't be enough to develop those skills. Um, you know, who would like to answer this? There's a lot of speakers that, that would be happy to answer this. Perhaps just unmute yourself and jump in um, for anyone who'd like to answer this one. How can we really... I think Dr. Sonia is, is, is a quite avid supporter of, uh, <laughs> of digital learning. So I think that question could pretty well be answered by Dr. Sonia, maybe, sure. as well as Dr. Atul and I think we'll argue. Yeah. Um, I think we can't expect, you know, universities to be everything to everyone. Um, that's, that's really the short answer and the assumption that, uh, we all, you know, evolve and grow and become these wonderful individuals. Cause we go to campus, um, is a little bit presumptuous about the quality of what's happening on campus for everybody. There's some people who go to campus and just, you know, find that it's a lot of overwhelming pieces and, and don't actually do well. That's why we have a 30% attrition rate in the first year. So I, I think what, what, what the conversations are in, in online learning, which I find interesting, is that um, we're so critical about every single piece and how we're going to do it, but we actually don't reflect as deeply on what the experience has been in the past on campus. And this said, I went on campus and I grew and I was one of the people who, who benefited greatly for campus. So Dr. Atul, you've got me there. But, <laughs> but I do think that, you know, maybe there's other ways of doing it. You know, maybe there's community centers um, that could pick up that piece. Um, you know, maybe if they are doing something online to gain greater access, this was what I was saying, but using spaces differently. You know, if there's a critical mass of individuals learning in a certain place that happens to be off campus, um, could they get together? Could they have mentorship um, tied to a corporate um, piece? Like we, we run a mentorship program with all of our scholars. Um, and right now we've got a 16 week mentorship program with 94 scholars and 94 mentors from the corporate world volunteers who just stepped up and said, yes, I will actually spend 16 weeks. This is not a, like a one week mentorship program, answering questions, meeting with them weekly and holding their hands and being that person in their lives that will sell them. Actually, you can't write an email like this. Actually, when you approach somebody on LinkedIn, that's not how it's done. Actually, let me just listen to how you're feeling um, and how you're coping. And and helping them find that, that space. So there's a lot of different ways that we can do it. And um, I'm just saying, let's explore them and let's not assume that the traditional ways was working for everyone because it simply wasn't. And I, I'll pass it to Dr. Etchwell to contradict me. Yeah, no. I, maybe I can be I, a middle like ground here as that, well. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I, I absolutely agree. What will happen is that the future will see multiple models of ways of educating because uh, every person has a different need. So there is a need for campus education. There is a need for, for online education. There is a need uh, for blended education. And in the future, there may be multiple more models that, that will come. But 
But I have a strong belief that one thing that will stay constant in the field of education is that we will have great visionaries and great philanthropists like uh, Mr. Al Gurir, um, who I've had the honor of meeting multiple times, a great visionary he is, and <clears throat> Dr. Ashok Chohan, who is the founder of the Amity Foundation. So individuals will always be there who are passionate uh, about uh, giving platforms to young people who deserve it, uh, who need it, who are passionate about building themselves. And everyone who is in the field of education, whether it is the faculty members or anyone who is involved, has this one mission that they want to do, give the best to the students that they are nurturing in whichever way the platform may be. We do not know what the future will hold, but this feeling of compassion, of caring will always be part of the education system. And that is what gives us hope and joy and happiness. Thank you, Dr. Atso. That was very- Arnie, had, Arnie wanted to add something. Yeah, I, 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 it's basically repeating what was just said, but it is, we're, we're a diverse society and there, there are diverse um, learning kind of needs and approaches. So I think having different approaches is, is the way of the future. Um, we happen to be approaching or adopting a strategy that's gonna be the, the best of both worlds. Uh, but I do think um, as you're seeing now, the traditional campus is not going to be the prevalent mode going forward. A lot of schools who, with you know strictly on campus kind of focus are going to shutter. You see them shuttering now, especially in the U.S. Um, so, it, you know, education really has to kind of look inward to see, think back, what you know, what their their value proposition is and what their reason for existence is. It, each institution is going to have to do that and then figure out the best way to deliver what they stand for best. And I think it's, it is gonna be a, a combination of, of the two. And I think Dr. Sonia said as well, you know, university is not for everyone. That's why you have that high drop rate for the first year. And, and, it's, and again, to reiterate what she said, um, they cannot be the solution, the panacea, because we're, we're talking about primary education as well. And, um, I'm not sure we're going to necessarily go fully online for that. I don't think we should. But from from primary education, making sure that those who aren't necessarily, um, you know, ready for for higher education could look at different opportunities, apprenticeships, for example, going straight to to programs that Schneider is is um, offering, uh, apprenticeship programs of that sort. So it it is it's a it's a diverse world. There are different ways of learning. Everyone approaches it differently. Um, but each institution is going to have to figure out what they excel at best and then how they can differentiate themselves because there are going to be schools that are going to be shutting down. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Perfect. Arnold. So I guess, I guess that was the last um, point or question that we could take for today because we are um, coming to a close. So I just wanted to thank all the speakers for their input. I believe you were very inspiring. I mean, most of the conversation was smooth and we did have some you know, controversy towards the end there, which is um, always good because it's always good to yeah. see um, the same the same topic from you know different perspectives uh, so I think it was great insights thank you all for joining uh, the Forbes Middle East uh, future of education webinar we hope to speak to you again sometime in the future if you've got any questions please send those over to Daniel I think Daniel has left his yes. uh, email, left in my email address in the, in the chat section uh, so you can send me your questions and uh, thank you so much Sarah. thank you Dr. Sonia you. Mark Dr. Atul Arni for taking time out from your busy schedules at this point in time and, and joining us for this conversation. I, like Sarai mentioned, I think it was very insightful and we've got some really good feedback as well. I think people were really involved in the conversation. There was quite a lot of comments coming in the chats and the question answer sessions as well. So thank you so much for joining in and uh, stay safe everyone, take care. It's time of the corona, I think, stay indoors. And uh, thank you so much for joining in, have a good safe you. day. Thank, Thank you, you. Thanks, Raya. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Raya. All the best. Bye.